Well, we're back. And this time we talk about everything from the 20th anniversary of National Cybersecurity Month to prompt bombing, AI, and what's next for identity and access management and authorization. Grab a cup of coffee or a giant chocolate bar and join us. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with a brand new episode for National Cybersecurity Month. Hello again. I'm Kelly O'Dwyer Manuel, and with me I have, as always, David Broussard. Hey, David, how's it going? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. As my grandpa used to say, can't complain, nobody's listening. So, um, but of course, we hope more people are listening. Uh, <laughs> and with Wait, that, sorry, in mind, were you saying something or I wasn't listening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, well, we should we should consider a stand up routine after this. I think, David, um, we should. Yeah, yeah, we'll get on that. But we digress. So, National Cybersecurity Month. This is, you know, it's we know that every cybersecurity vendor out there is going to have something going on. But this is a particularly notable uh, time for this this particular month. It's the twenty twentieth anniversary of National Cybersecurity Month. So the 20th of anything, right? As a marketer, I'm going to automatically think, hey, let's talk about what's happened in the last 20 years. Why is this such a momentous occasion? But I want to be more specific here, David, because I know you have some viewpoints on not only the journey of identity and access management, but the journey of some of the stakeholder groups therein. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of our friends in the developer community and how their interaction with identity teams and with identity and access management solutions and technologies has changed in the last 20 years. So, I mean, I've, that was really long winded. Uh, clearly I need less caffeine before we record these, but where do you want to start? What's, what's kind of piquing your interest more, the, the identity journey or the developer journey? I, I think a bit of both, um, and not just the identity journey, of course. It's also the the whole IAM landscape, and you know, um, in IAM and over the past 10, 15 years, not twenty, um, it's it's really been I, and then to list that sort of degree, AM. It's always been about the identity piece, right. and you know, Kelly, you say it's it's twenty years of Cybersecurity Month. What were we doing before two thousand and three? Like, where were we? Um, <laughs> Uh, did security not matter? How was, fr from a business perspective, how did you do employee onboarding? How did you do employee offboarding? How many rogue employees did you have? Like, what what happened um, uh, before those 20 years? Um, so I think it's fair to say that obviously everyone cares about security and everyone cares about cybersecurity. I, I think one of the things that probably has changed over the past 20 years is how much we've become digitized. Um, it was probably already the case in 2000, 2003. We all worked with computers and the internet was a thing. Uh, but the amount of data, the amount of services, the amount of identities um, has just have just gone up ever since. Everything is online. Um, and of course, stuff that has happened since then is a lot of SaaS has happened, right? So the original SaaS company, um, you could argue, might be uh, Salesforce founded in 1999. But since um, a lot of people were saying, oh, well, yeah, you can move some stuff to SaaS, uh, but we will never move um, core security products to SaaS. And then Okta comes along. And I don't remember the date. I'm sorry. Um, and they say, no, no, we'll run your LDAP from SaaS. And people were like, that's crazy. And look at them today. A, a lot of companies run um, their identity practice from SaaS. And that changes the the whole cyber, cyber blah, I'm sorry, and that changes the whole cybersecurity landscape because it opens up new opportunities, but also new threats. So lots and lots has has changed. The vectors have changed. Um, and then Kelly, you you were saying the the developer angle. Twenty years ago, twenty plus years ago, developers quote only developed apps. They did not think about security. One of the big changes has been saying, telling the developers, hey, you've got to think about a secure development lifecycle, secure software development lifecycle. Think about building security from the get-go, not as an afterthought. Uh, and that's really fundamental. Uh, but also having tools and 
capabilities and services at their fingertips that they can use to implement security mechanisms. So it, for us, of course, it means identity capabilities or access control capabilities, but it's also encryption capabilities, you know, storing data at rest in, in, in a secure way. The fact that those libraries and services are now more prevalent and easier to use makes it easier on developers to adopt secure practices and to make their products more secure. We'll have to count how many times we use the word secure, by the way, Kelly. <laughs> we could run a contest, I think, and, and whoever has the correct guess gets a bag of jelly beans. Um, there we go. Yeah, yeah, some some security jelly beans. Um, that's interesting. And I mean, you know, I can, I'm old enough now, uh, or so I'm told that I can think back to 20 years ago and even the experience from an end user side, right, was so wholly different. You'd go into work, you'd sit down at your desk, you'd log in through a VPN or, mm -hmm. or enter the code from your, uh, your, your little, your little tag from, from RSA and bingo, you were in there. It wasn't, it wasn't so much it wasn't as easy. There was lots of friction to be able to get there. But once you were there, you were there. The authentication was felt, at least from the end user perspective, absolute. So that's certainly been a, a monumentous change. Yep. What, would, what would you say, David, if you look back, is something maybe you thought was going to change but didn't? And why do you think that is? So... Let's talk about what has changed for the better, and definitely yeah. authentication has. Right. Um, if I think back to my first experiences as, as an intern um, at, at a company, um, I would log in with Novell at the time, I think, uh, uh -huh. on my Windows machine, and there was no other authentication. There was nothing else I could do. There was no internet. I had an internet, but internet access was forbidden, so that kind of limited the exposure as well. Um, and then back then, the, the conversation was not about, it was not a security conversation. It was not about, oh, you have the internet, it's a it's a security threat. It was more of a productivity thing. If you have access to the internet, you're going to slack on the job. Right. Who knew? Um, but the other things that did happen back in the day, like, like you said, you, you were going into the office, therefore you were in an internal deemed more secure network. Um, you would do the one login and then for every single other service you had to use, say payroll, HR, whatever it might be, you had a different credential. So one thing that has changed for the better is definitely single sign on. That has been a massive thing. And yes. then more recently, uh, introducing MFA, like expecting that uh, employees have to enter a second factor um, to, to be able to complete the authentication that has changed for the better. It doesn't necessarily make, unfortunately, MFA does not necessarily make the user experience better. And that's why a lot of folks are focusing right now on uh, key pass um, and passwordless authentication. I think that's going to be the next wave that we see that's going to bring more secure um, uh, authentication. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear that there's a balance to be had between great UX and and security and that's that's a wrong balance to think of you should be trading off one for the other um mfa is better security but it, it flies in the face of good ux because it's disruptive and people don't always know how to use mfa and where do they get the code from is it an sms which we all know is weak is it a is it a um an authenticator app, in which case you have to teach people to use an authenticator app, which is you know a challenge. Is it a, is it a, a pop up on your phone, in which case you could have MFA fatigue? Or I think you know, Kelly, you you told me once that it was called uh, uh, MFA bombing. I think you called it corrupt bombing. Corrupt bombing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so those still need to be solved. Hopefully, passwordless off and and key pass will get us there um, in the near future. To answer your question, though, what has not changed, it, again, selfishly, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the cover to axiomatics here. Um, <laughs> the authorization piece still needs to be solved to some degree. Um, I also think more broadly that we need to keep educating developers to the importance of security and baking security right from the very beginning, right from the requirements. And I say developers, I should also. Of say the product managers, right? The product owners, those who design the products, they have to think about security not as an afterthought, but as as a first class requirement. Making the app secure, making the uh, 
UX in line with security as well. And, and there's lots of little things that you can do. But more selfish, selfishly, I think authorization, because it's straddled two worlds, right? The world of identity and the world of authentication on the one hand, um, and then the world of the application, the world of data, the world of services on the other. Authorization is is the next thing, the next nut that we need to crack from a cybersecurity standpoint. Sense and it brings up a couple of interesting questions, David. Because I think you know, to your point, and I've had a few different conversations with people far smarter than I about these things. But in terms of the next wave of authentication and authorization, I mean, so many organizations are still really struggling with authentication, and mm -hmm. even those that are trying to adopt more forward-thinking um, routes like passwordless almost meet resistance. It's almost like we've been conditioned to believe that if there isn't some friction in the end user experience, mm -hmm. it mustn't be secure. So passwordless kind of makes people feel a little uncomfortable because it's it's not the, the friction of having to answer a question or enter a password and then enter something else and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, isn't there. Yep. Is, do you feel is how much of an impediment is that? And and what are the things that the authorization space? So so you know, axiomatics and others can be learning as we see um the auth authentication space mature that we might look to adopt. So you touch on a couple of really good points. First of all, there's this this thing called security theater that seeing security is thinking it's more secure, it's not true, right? The the best security is probably the one that you don't see, um, right? Uh, or or at least the visibility, the the annoyance, um, the, the presence of security doesn't mean that it's more secure or less secure, right? So we shouldn't rely on that. I mean, TSA is a great example of that. Uh, you go through airport security, it's very visible today. Does it make it more secure? I don't know. Are there things that we could do better? Maybe. Um, so the the amount of visible security is definitely not an indicator of how good security is, right? And so uh, prompting a user for a very complex password um, doesn't make the system more secure. And there have been quite a few studies saying that you know password policies are, are, are no longer the way to go. Sure, you do have to have some kind of strong password, but not to the extent that the person has to write it down on a on a on a post-it note and stick it on their monitor because that actually defeats the purpose of having um that 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 strong password in the first place. So that's when we need to we need to have MFA or passwordless authentication or or these other mechanisms. What it means for us though, um the authorization vendors is that we should not put all our eggs in the authentication basket. And what I mean by that is historically you're authenticated, you're in, you can do whatever. Uh, but actually, we need to start um, thinking in more fine-grained ways. Whereas if you've been authenticated, good for you. It doesn't mean you can do everything and anything within the enterprise. We're going to have to put policies in place that control what you can do and under what circumstances. And that's where fine-grained authorization comes in. And that ties into um, what Zero Trust has been mandating, right? It's verify always. Verify that you are who you say you are. Verify that you're supposed to do what you're trying to do. Right. So we want to be doing that check uh, continuously, not just when you go walk through that door. No, that makes good sense. And I mean, certainly even the and as we were just talking about, even the the way in which people are accessing corporate assets has changed mm -hmm. monumentally. Even I think you could make the argument even in the last three to five years. Um, and when I think of the last three to five years, David, and I know we talked about this a little before we we jumped on our, our podcast together, I think about zero trust and the evolution that that particular strategy has made in the last few years has been monumental. But but yet still, I see lots of figures saying anything from 50 to 80 percent of implementations aimed at zero trust are going to fail or are failing or people aren't don't know where to start now we've learned all this stuff why is stuff like this still a struggle why is this still a problem for folks well um i think you can solve all these things these are why i uh, this is why i ask you these questions <laughs> yeah thank you um there's a lot of fear you if there's if there's one thing you don't want to mess up it's security um and 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 controlling access to your most most valuable assets 
And of course, the more you're online, the 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 riskier it gets. Um, and that's that's kind of the fud that was around when cloud came came about, and and some folks started saying we can move our identities to the cloud, and other folks said, no, you're not moving my LDAP to the cloud; it's staying on prem because it's more secure, right? So there is that fud that if it's online, it's more vulnerable. Um, I would counter that um, an identity vendor is probably more secure than um, any one random company because that's what they do for a living. So they've thought through all the threats. They have a recovery plan. They have uh, uh, you know, uh, detection mechanisms to make sure that their systems are not under attack. Um, so um, if, if I was going to implement an identity solution, I would probably buy service from someone than I would write my own because the, the odds of me making a mistake are higher than a specialist making that mistake. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean that it makes the problem easy to solve. You, as as a CISO, as a CISO, you have to think about the different threat vectors and the evolution of the threat vectors. You have to think um, about uh, the malicious employee and how you prevent the malicious employee from from doing something you don't want them to do. Bear in mind that the malicious employee can authenticate, right? There's there's nothing yeah. to stop the malicious employee from logging in because they are a legit employee. So do you now do? Uh, pattern detection and you know behavior anomaly detection. Uh, these are things that you have to start looking into. You also need to make sure that you're and, and we're only by the way in all the examples I'm giving we're only focusing on employee identity. There's a whole other slew of problems for consumer identity too, and it's a different scale because a company might have a thousand employees or maybe a hundred thousand employees if it's a big company. But if you talk about consumers, a, a retail company has millions of consumers. The scale is vastly different with you know, potential for brand damage much much bigger um so you you have to think about uh those the, the the so the malicious employee the malicious consumer uh, you have to think about uh the onboarding the offboarding you have to think about provisioning the right permissions deprovisioning the permissions that someone no longer uses making sure that you always have the least amount of priv privileges that you need and that's where uh, what we do, of course, you know, shameless plug um, comes in, right? If you have a clear policy that states what users can't can and can't do, and I say users, it could also be services and clients. Doesn't have to be humans. Uh, then you're going to be in a better shape. But why is it so hard? Simply because it involves everyone at the company. It involves uh, you talked about developers. It involves the developers building apps. It involves that you. It, it requires that you have a good overall picture of what services, what applications, what data you have and how you're exposing it. So it kind of requires a almost like an enterprise architect who has that vision, who has that understanding of what you're exposing in the enterprise. And that's not an easy feat. No, that makes that makes sense. I, I think I think that's that's quite right. And it does certainly explain a lot of the Oh, a, a lot of the not only um, hesitation but frustration with some of of how people are are able to move forward the, in this and what they want to expect, and you know certainly from a marketing perspective as well, right? There's lots of organizations that say they are the zero trust solution, which we know isn't doesn't exist. There's no one solution that's going to be the magic button that's going to give you zero trust across your your organization. Um, but it certainly has been one of the biggest changes, I think, in the last 20 years has been zero trust moving from ideology through to actual uh, a pragmatic strategy that you can implement within your enterprise. Yeah, I think, Kelly, to, we, to, to expand on the point you just made, something that we have successfully achieved in the past 20 years is getting rid, largely getting rid of the authentication silos where in the past within a given company you might have had 10 20 30 different LDAPs or ADs running around that would keep copies of who you are Kelly and keep copies of who I am and maybe the same password maybe not the same password who knows right we've 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 managed to sort of get rid of the silos and have one single source of identity for the entire enterprise that's a huge win at the same time we've also to some extent managed to achieve authentication on multiple layers. So going back to zero trust, so authenticating within the app, but also authenticating within the network layer, authenticating within uh, another layer. So that's also interesting because as you go past these different layers, we'll be able to verify your identity. That's also 
fundamental. Um, and then little by little, what we're starting to address is is um, cleaning up the entitlement mess where historically right. we're very much in a provisioning, deprovisioning mode where you rely on how good the entitlements are, how good the roles are, and how good your process for enabling and disabling is. And of course, there's, there's lots of issues with that, um, such as the time to provisioning, the time to deprovisioning that could be too long, right? And now we're, we're seeing those policy-driven approaches um, um, in the marketplace and in the standards community address uh, the the entitlement mess that we've been in. And I think that's what we're going to see. I and mean, that's what we've been working on, of course, on axiomatics for the past few years. And that's what we're going to keep working on for the next few years. And in a previous podcast, Kelly, I mentioned the work that we're doing under the umbrella of the OpenID Foundation yes. uh, with the Policy Charter Group. Uh, we're going to keep doing that work. And we're actually getting together in just under a month um, at the, um, I keep forgetting what IAW stands for. I think it's the Internet Identity Week or the Identity Internet Week. I keep getting the acronym wrong. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, this is, the, for me at least, it's one of the next steps. That, I mean, that that all makes very good sense. And it really does, as soon as you started talking about just all of those layers and and gosh, deep provisioning, discussions about provisioning and deprovisioning have been around forever. So it really is ad identity first security. And it, that term sounds like it should be really redundant, but it's it's almost like it's even more essential than ever because identities themselves, while, while you know, my identity certainly hasn't changed, the way in which I'm using that online, um, in corporate networks and things like that has changed substantially. It's, it's more difficult than ever to get that right. So that's uh, that's really interesting. And I think it does probably lead well to my next question, which is what what happens now if we were to go, you know, five, 10 years down the road, David, where are we going to be best guess if you were to look into your crystal ball uh, in the identity landscape and, you know, again, shamelessly in the authorization landscape? So I kind of have two answers to this. Um, so the, the 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 first thing is tied to, or they're both tied to AI. Um, so one thing we know is going to happen in the next five to ten years is that the amount of data, the amount of services, the amount of clients, the amount of everything is just going to keep on growing. We're going to be more and more dependent on digital assets um, today. Parts of the population do uh, electronic health records. Not everyone. Tomorrow, everyone will. And and you know, ideally, hopefully, in the future, we can actually ex exchange those medical records between the hospitals. Whereas right now, although I, as a patient, I can see my medical records from hospital X Y Z, I can't easily share it with hospital A B C. That's probably hopefully going to change in the future, which means a, a, a lot more need for authentication, for authorization, for data sharing consent, for patient consent, for user managed access, like uh, all of these things are to become even more critical. So just the amount of things we do online is, is going to go up dramatically. Um, but the other thing is, of course, AI. And um, back at Identiverse 2023, I think we, we mentioned it a little bit in one of the previous podcasts, Andre Duran of Paying Identity uh, did a really cool presentation. It was kind of funny. He was he was on stage and he was sitting down, not moving, which is very unlike him. And he was talking and he was showing some slides. And you know, like I was whispering to uh, a peer of mine next to me who also knows Andre. And and you know, both of us were like, "Wait, is he normal? Like, did he hurt his ankle or what's up with him?" And eventually, like after five minutes of of a monologue, he stands up and he says, "Everything you heard so far was AI." The slides were AI, the speech was AI, I did not open my mouth, and yet you thought it was me. Trust is broken. And what that means is account recovery is going to become harder. It used to be that if you were the, the CEO or an employee of a relatively small company, you could call your admin and say, hey, um, Kelly, the admin, I'm David, and you know I have this customer presentation in five minutes, I'm in a taxi, my credentials went toast. Can you please reset the access and please set the password to um, I am the best one, two, three exclamation mark. And of course, Kelly, the admin wanting to help the CEO who's got this really important meeting uh, does it, right? That's exactly the example that Andre took in, in at, at the conference. 
with AI, we're not going to be able to trust that. By the way, no one should ever do that, right? But uh, when there is pressure, you know, when the scammers right. put pressures on, pressure on on individuals, it's incredible what humans are capable of doing, even though they know it's wrong. AI is going to make that even more, even worse, if you will, because we're going to think it really is that person calling. We're going to think it really is our grandmother who needs five hundred dollars because she's stuck somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So, AI is going to break the trust that we used to have. We can no longer trust what we see. We can no longer trust what we hear. It's going to become very, very difficult to you know discriminate between what's what's right and what's not right, and and that's going to create a lot of issues around account recovery. If you lose your um, and account recovery in the enterprise world is not easy, but at least you could always walk up to an office and meet an admin in person with perhaps your government issued ID and um, they can verify a few things about you and reset your password. But as a consumer, it's it's way harder. Like if you have a PayPal account and for some reason you forgot the password or you lost your MFA method, how do you walk up to a PayPal office to get that to be reset? It's all online. It's, it's going to be very hard to to recover those accounts. So account recovery is going to be really hard to, it already is hard, but uh, with AI is going to be even harder. And then going further, I'm wondering, and this might be a little far-fetched, maybe a little blue sky, but I'm wondering whether AI can get to a point where it can consume all the events we're generating all the time and essentially do anomaly detection on the fly so fast that maybe we we no longer need um, uh, security up front, but rather we could do security on the fly because AI is monitoring the systems and is realizing there's a deviation that should be happening. What's really cool with that is it also helps with um, scenarios that you could not possibly foresee, like the disgruntled employee. So for instance, you know, in, in a traditional authorization scenario, you could say, oh, an employee in finance can can download finance documents. But it's really hard to put a limit like an employee in finance can't download more than 10 documents in a day because maybe they need to do it, right? So the policy is not going to prevent you from doing that. But AI, however, could determine that, oh, this employee, every single Monday, first Monday of the month, they download 17 documents, no more, no less, okay? But Today, Tuesday, they downloaded 247 finance documents, including pay slips for one specific employee who is not the same employee. That looks fishy. Maybe I'm going to prevent that from happening. So I see there's huge opportunity for AI to help us with better security because it's going to be able to listen on a scale that humans can't. That that makes sense. And it's moving towards a more proactive, almost real, real-time everywhere model. Whereas, yeah. you know, instead of having that that constant need for okay, stop point in time analysis of things, um, yeah. which, right, I mean, we're, those are almost redundant as soon as they happen because you move a second past the time in which that has occurred and there's a whole new set of events that you haven't looked at yet. So it's, uh, that would be a very, a very hopeful way to engage AI. Um, yeah, that's a, that maybe that, that kind of hope might be a good note to end on there, David, as I see we've, covered a whole whack of information. It's always um, an insightful and interesting conversation. And I think we've we've done a service to 20 years of National Cybersecurity Month and 20 years uh, more, more specifically around identity and access management and authorization. So uh, thanks again for an always engaging and interesting conversation. I look forward to the next one. My pleasure. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. And if you have ideas for a future conversation, please hit us up uh, and let us know. Until next time, take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Dynamically Speaking. Stay tuned for our next one. And in the meantime, check the show notes and connect with us on LinkedIn and YouTube. And visit us at axiomatics.com to learn more about our authorization solution.